uh, sort of the impact of COVID uh, on our health services and how we navigate our way through all of this. Um, and uh, tonight's uh, quite an occasion, actually, um, and I'll, I'll mention that in a second. But just for a bit of housekeeping, if everybody could uh, mute their microphones, it avoids any uh, feedback on the broadcast. And indeed, if you if you want to uh, avoid uh, uh, people uh, seeing anything or people running around in the background of your house, you could also mute your video. Uh, often that gives a better quality sound and broadcast at the same time. So it's up to you. Um, so tonight, as I said, is a, a quite an occasion. Um, it's the uh, first uh, uh, webinar uh, to be hosted by our new president, uh, Professor Ronan O'Connell. And Professor O'Connell uh, was elected vice president and uh, was installed today officially as president of the RCSI. And uh, uh, Ronan will give us a few words uh, to open up today's webinar uh, and a view and a perspective from his, from his role as president of the college and the leadership that uh, we, we will be looking forward to uh, during his term. And uh, so congratulations, Ronan. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, quite a year that you've started, that's for sure. Um, but uh, it'll be it'll be great to, to get you to get you, uh, your leadership on this. And then I suppose to acknowledge uh, our outgoing president, uh, Mr. Ken Mealy, and for all the work that he's done through his term as well. So we're in a time of change, constant change, um, and that, that's to be expected. Uh, and so I suppose to think about the future and the impact of all of this, uh, we're going to be joined by uh, Professor Sam McConkie, who's the head of the Department of International Health and Tropical Medicine at RCSI. And uh, Sam, who's, uh, I guess, no stranger to everybody out there, uh, well, anybody certainly who's been watching the TV over the last few months and uh, listening to the radio, and uh, and Sam, I, I, your 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 biggest fan is my mother-in-law. Would you believe? Um, so uh, <laughs> she, she she tells me I should listen to every word you say and follow that. And I think we we all probably agree with that. So you're going to give us perspective on how the healthcare delivery uh, West program and system that we have in Ireland will have to change at a national level and kind of that very high level perspective. Um, and all the interdependencies of everything across our system to be looked at there. And then we're also joined Professor Owen Debarra, who's a consultant in infectious disease in Bowman Hospital. We can zone in more specifically on what the hospital working environment and how it will have to change for our patients and our staff um, uh, as we uh, manage uh, our way through the COVID issue. So without any further uh, uh, delay, I'm going to invite our new president, Professor Ronan O'Connell, uh, to uh, give us a perspective and uh, some insight into the future uh, during his presidency. So we're running over to you. Thank you, Kieran. Uh, well, first of all, uh, it's a bit strange being a, a virtual president. Uh, it was uh, a great privilege uh, to be uh, elected president for CSI. Uh, as long as I can remain a virtual president and not be looked up to become a, a virtuous president, I'll be happy. But uh, it, uh, is a real challenge and yet an exciting opportunity at this time of uh, uh, of considerable uh, difficulty uh, for the country economically and in the healthcare environment. I think uh, I'd like to echo at the first uh, uh, juncture uh, the comments made already um, about Ken Mealy. Ken uh, really gave us great leadership um, as a surgical college um, over the last uh, three months uh, in particular um, and his uh, wise counsel and uh, close interaction with um, HSE and other bodies has served the profession well. So uh, we are all very grateful to Ken. Uh, we're also very indebted to Sam and to Owen for the work that they've done. Um, I remember hearing Sam's uh, presentation uh, to, I think it was perhaps surgical affairs or maybe it was to council, but uh, you scared the proverbial out of us and everything you said uh, uh, at the time almost came to pass. You forewarned of this pandemic and what it could do to our society and to our healthcare. And because you were so uh, prescient, um, the college actually acted quickly. So by the first week in February, uh, the college was looking as to how it might uh, maintain its business model. And uh, the college itself, the university aspect of it, has managed to do that. And we are very grateful to you uh, for giving us that level of insight and warning. With regard to the delivery of surgical uh, services, uh, I think all of the right decisions were made in terms of closing things down um, and we have managed uh, 
within, I suppose, tragic parameters, but we have managed uh, uh, to get to get through uh, this. The real challenge now is, of course, that profound changes are needed, and some of them are long overdue. I mean, we have had things like Enterococcus and MRSA and other serious pathogenic uh, organisms in our uh, environment for a long time, and yet the infrastructure has not been able uh, to eradicate or even to cope with these in the most part. Uh, some of our behaviours have not uh, been appropriate and um, aspects of hygiene left a lot to be desired within our healthcare system. And so it is now, I think, very appropriate that we would look uh, to try and address all these uh, deficiencies, all the time being cognizant that our parents' generation and their parents uh, uh, lived uh, with the, the knowledge that infectious diseases were always there, uh, they were endemic. TB, polio, uh, typhoid, earlier earlier generations plague. And, and, and we have come in our lives really to accept things like AIDS as being a chronic disease. And, and we really haven't faced up to the reality of something that would just sweep across like, uh, like typhoid did in Dublin in the 1830s and again later in the 1800s and, um, and, and really caused immense, immense uh, uh, tragedy. And we have long advocated in surgery the need to separate out acute from elective surgery. And perhaps this is the vehicle that will allow us to do this, that it will give us protected beds and a clean pathway for elective surgery. And I hope that we will be able to drive that message through. And of course, the other thing it has done is it has exposed our uh, great uh, deficiency in intensive care and um, high dependency resources. We have less than half the average EU 27 uh, ratio of um, intensive care beds to head a per 100,000 population. And we've known this and we have coped just about, but now it's clear that these things are going to have to change. And then access to diagnostics. About half the patients who are admitted to our hospitals are admitted for diagnostics, because if you don't admit somebody, they won't get the CT scan, they won't get the MRI scan. And we're going to have to change that because we simply cannot accommodate these people in a COVID-free environment with the infrastructures that we have. So there are immense changes that are, I hope, going to be the benefits of the, the tragedy that we've experienced. So with that, I'll ask Sam and Owen uh, if they would give us their thoughts about um, how we're going to operate in a COVID environment and reintroduce services. Thank you both very much. Um, thanks. Thanks, Ron. I'm proposing to speak for about uh, 10 to 15 minutes and then to take some questions and then to uh, in, hand over to Owen. Is that, is that a reasonable format for, for everyone? Uh, yes, I think the best way to get the questions is if people can use the chat function, which if you're looking at your screen as I am, it's up there on the, the top uh, left and you'll be able to uh, send in questions and then Kieran can um, act as the, uh, the chair. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm happy with that. So um, I... I uh, obviously started uh, seeing this uh, problem in uh, the beginning of January. Like many infectious disease doctors, I, I watch a, a website called ProMed and uh, ProMed sends out uh, one or three or four emails a day to people who are interested for free, telling us about what outbreaks in animals or humans are happening around the world. And that came about the second or third of January. It was clear that in Wuhan, there was an outbreak of pneumonia among many adults. Um, then almost every day, there was more follow-up on this. An investigatory team around the 12th of January, at that stage from preliminary studies, said there was no evidence of um, uh, human to human transmission at that time. And unfortunately, I think some folks sort of took the, that as absurdly reassuring and said, no, that, that's proof that it's not human to human, therefore we don't need to do anything about it. Um, a day or two later, we came out that it was a coronavirus, 
And we already have four coronaviruses in Ireland um, spreading around very smoothly. So we know a lot about the old coronaviruses. But frighteningly, we've also seen SARS-1 and seen MERS. Uh, so a lot of us in ID have a lot of respect for coronaviruses because MERS uh, killed about 40% of uh, people who got it. And many, many healthcare workers were infected. Uh, in one case arrived in South Korea and several dozens of healthcare workers in South Korea caught it and about 40% of them died. So, so it, it was a terrifying prospect once it was clear it was a coronavirus. As uh, January wore on, it became clear it was spreading to other parts of China about 14 days later, then spreading to South Korea, Taiwan and other countries like Vietnam around it. Um, once it became clear that it wasn't being contained in China, then in, in my view, in the last week in January, it was clear that there was an opportunity of a worldwide um, pandemic. Um, the data from China then was about a 1%, uh, 1 to 5% mortality, uh, which doesn't sound very much. And as President Trump says, they told me it didn't have a very high mortality compared to SARS and MERS, which is true. But 1% of half the world is, is still, uh, you know, uh, sort of 40 million people. So, so it's, still a, it's still a massive... Um, problem even if you just have a, a, a reproductive rate of two and a, a mortality one percent so so it's completely transformed things um they as you have alluded to i end up getting into media i i suppose my experience i worked for a couple of years for the irish nuns in sierra leone in a mission hospital and end up in the middle of a big war which i hadn't signed up to uh, doing a lot of surgery by the way which i really enjoyed but we ended up getting overtaken by the rebels. And looking back on that experience in the 90s, I felt I should have um, spoken out more and more clearly and more articulately to the people of influence around me at the time about that. And that partly inspired me to be quite outspoken and quite forward about uh, what I could see was obviously going to happen. So I ended up on Sean O'Rourke telling the RTE listeners that this was gonna happen, then on Matt Cooper and working out a worst case scenario. I also shared the same presentation as Ronan alluded to with Suzanne Mitchell, who's the deputy editor of the Sunday Business Post. She fact checked it against the Department of Health and they didn't deny that the worst case scenario I'd pointed out could happen. And then that became a front page Sunday Business Post article and suddenly everyone sat up and said, there's something big here. So that's um, been the health aspects. Uh, it's also been clear that the economic aspects of this are huge. Um, I'm going to quote the Financial Times from about 16 days ago, Monday of two weeks ago. They quoted the Bank of England. Uh, the Bank of England and the Financial Times obviously are London-based. They're not known for being alarmist. They're among the most conservative uh, sort of business papers and business analysts in the world. And the Bank of England's view is that this will be the deepest and fastest recession since the great freeze of 1709. So initially, everyone was benchmarked against the banking crisis of 2008. That's, that's clearly dramatically underestimating it. I had benchmarked against the 1929 economic crash and said it was more like that. But the, the Bank of England is saying this is as fast, faster and deeper than... Um, than the 1709 crash. So I would say that that's relevant to surgery because all of us are going to be in an economic environment that might have, uh, you know, 20% less GDP uh, for a period of time. Now, as um, I end up the privilege of being asked to brief the political parties of every ilk, both north and south of the border over the last three months, and still ongoing contact with many of them. And as one opposition um, spokesperson for economics said, Sam, how long is this going to last? Uh, and I simply said, I don't know. There are too many variables and I can't have any opinion on that. Uh, because obviously, if it only lasts two or three months and the economy is back to normal, it'll bounce back quickly. This famous V-shaped recovery, many folk now are not expecting a V-shaped recovery and are saying um, the economic impact of this could last uh, many, not just many months, but even several years. So I think all of us need to prepare for a healthcare and financial environment that's completely different from 2019. Not not just the airline industry and the and the cruise industry, and that's that's obviously bad for all of us. Um, moving on then um, to the impacts, uh, supply chains have been completely disrupted. So many people thought that their goods just came in just in time. 
but almost all of us have been affected by running out of stuff. That's been catastrophic in UK with PPE. In Ireland, we didn't quite completely run out of PPE, but we end up using weird stuff that we weren't familiar with, which was difficult. Um, another aspect of the, the challenge has been um, staffing. And I think we all know one nursing home famously had 24 nurses and only seven of them were available for work on one particular week. Now, um, all credit to the RCSI hospitals group, they stepped in and helped that particular one. But the idea that uh, seven out of 24 of your staff were left standing and the other 17 are Oslocher, sick, unable to come to work because of self-isolation was nobody anticipated that that would be the, the case. I'd predicted a 20 percent um, need for extra staff, that every organisation whose essential service should upskill by um, 20 percent. Um, but I didn't anticipate 60 percent need. Um, I, am, I, I spotted Hannah's uh, face on the thing, and I know Hannah's outlined very clearly when she asked me to be deputy dean as she was sick i'd end up having to step in for dean i really hope for rcsi and the students sake that that doesn't happen because while i'm very comfortable doing media and infectious disease and epidemics i don't feel i could fill hannah's shoes in any way shape or form anything like as good as she does but my point is that hannah already had four other deputy deans or vice deans ready to stand in if she was out sick and that's an example of how rcsi even before COVID 19 had a, a nominated designate in place uh, for for many many key staff Similarly, if my role in Beaumont, if I was unable to fulfil it, thankfully Owen and there are also two other staff who could who could fill that role. So that was so we all need redundancy built into our human resources. Uh, also, as cleaners, as healthcare assistants, not just as senior staff, but that that will be important um, when this virus comes back. Because even though it's going away now, it's almost inevitable it's going to come back in some way, shape, or form. I hope the next one is not a second wave. I hope it's a second ripple that we're smart enough to deal with it better this next time. So the last point I'll make uh, about where we're at now is around the sort of national state of fear, anxiety, tension, and how that is bringing out both the best in people and also some of the narkiest, most puritanical, most Taliban-like, and the worst in people. And um, sort of arguments like the precautionary principle, which you've all heard from infection control multiple times, are now being used to justify um, extreme measures that we're struggling to wind back from. So I'm sure many of you are struggling with operating theatres that have been left vacant for half an hour between cases to let the droplets settle. And certainly if you have a case of COVID-19 in your operating theatre, that's a good idea. But now that we've almost no community transmission in Ireland, and now that we're even testing lots of patients before they go to the OR and we know they're negative, this idea of leaving your operating room half an hour for the droplets to settle when there aren't any COVID-19 in your area is, is particularly daft. Uh, particularly, you know, I'm very, very heartened to see in counties like Sligo, I don't know if there's anyone from Sligo Hospital here or Donegal, in the northwest, uh, they haven't had a case for two weeks in Sligo County. So it simply stopped transmitting itself over there. And that, that's really, really good news. Um, that means that things really, schools, creches and surgery should get back up and running in, in Sligo, if you like, fairly promptly. Uh, and the, the challenge then of dividing the country into the sort of parts that have controlled and the parts that haven't controlled is a topic that Neffet have been talking about. It, it has a complexity that people start then getting confused about the rules or following the rules for the next county next to them rather than the one that they're in. And it can lead to a diffusion of the message. But I, I do think the next phase in the next month or two is really trying to lead um, some sort of restitution of con confidence, some sort of build, rebuilding of trust and happiness and um, confidence in actually getting on with living our life. Because without that, the economic um, consequences which I've talked about right from the start will, will be multiplied many fold. If we don't all get back to work, get back to high productivity, it, it, it's really all about productivity at this stage, not just in the health sector and surgery, but in, in the whole of our country. You, you can't just live on borrowed money forever or live on charities. We have to actually produce stuff to be wealthy. And that could well be, you know, hip replacements and knee replacements is, is in my view, as important production as any other part of the economy. Um, so, so I think there's rebuilding of trust and um, trying to help people get back to high levels of productivity again. And that's, I think, a challenge for uh, obviously our government, but even those of us I've been privileged to be in the media, also trying to rebuild some of that trust again. So I'm going to leave it at that and take questions and then hand over to Owen, if that's okay.
I'm, I'm aware there might be themes that people want me to talk about that I haven't addressed. Sam, thanks a million for that, uh, Kieran. Here, the uh, so what we do is we would ask maybe Owen to give the perspective from the changing hospital environment, and then we go to the Q and A session afterwards through the panel. Then at that point, if, if that's okay, and again, thanks for your insight and and for and for uh, all your work you've been doing for us uh, on on this uh, crisis during uh, during the, the last few months. And um, so, uh, Owen, Professor Owen, Owen Debarra is a consultant in infectious diseases at Bowen Hospital, and uh, and Owen, I mean, everyone's very interested in the lots and lots of questions around how we're going to how our hospital environment is going to utterly change um, and how long that's going to remain changed for I guess uh, lots of questions we probably won't have answers but at least we might come at them in, a, in an intelligent way uh, in, in asking them that's for sure so uh, delighted to get your perspective on, on what's going to happen to our environment uh, in the next uh, while thanks Owen. Thanks. Thanks very much. And thanks very much for the uh, the invite. And as you said, alluded to, I don't think I have all the answers or any of the answers, but nobody had any answers any. whatsoever in January. So um, we may get there. I have a few slides, so I'm going to share my screen, which uh, hopefully should work. Uh, people can see that. Yeah, oh, and we yeah. can see that. All right. OK. Yeah. So and again, I would just remind everybody to mute their microphones if they can. It's better for the sound quality. So thanks, Owen. All yours. Just make sure it's actually yeah, there's some. Let me try that one more time. It disappeared for me. Have you got it now? So with, with any infection, there's often this iceberg effect. OK, so we, we know the first few cases that happened are the deaths, but actually there's a huge number below the water. And the thing that we didn't know about COVID early on was that these asymptomatic infections were a significant portion of the problem. And really, that's largely why we end up with a pandemic that uh, a low mortality rate, but a high attack rate and a high asymptomatic rate. When you know you have a, a pandemic is when the, uh, the dogs in the street are talking the terminology of containment, control and mitigation. And um, Ireland at the moment really is still in control and mitigation. Um, we're trying to push government through um, the expert advisory group in an effort to say, are we actually going for elimination as in trying to remove it from this island or are we going to end up living with this? And it very much looks like we'll just be living with it for the time being. You could say that this slide summarizes where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to obviously prevent the infection in the community and in the hospital with the, the nice little icons, washing, cleaning, the distance looking out for symptoms and the red bit, which I'll come back to again. If you have a fever or a cough, you should stay home regardless of your travel history or contact history or indeed where you work. And that's been an issue for us. And I'll, I'll come back to that. But of course, the distance bit, the two meters is what's a real challenge for us in our workplaces. We know not fit for purpose. And as the president has very not kindly alluded to, that's our biggest challenge. We've known our infrastructure has been terrible for a long time, but maybe this is the time we might actually do something about it. Again, Sam talked briefly about what are the scenarios of the future. And there's largely three scenarios of infection that we might experience. This one where we'd have experienced a wave or a surge. And we may have following on continuous small low level surges or waves. Um, and they'll be geographically spaced and temporarily spaced. It may be like the 1918 flu pandemic where there was an initial surge and six months later there was a much larger surge. And this is a thing that concerns all of us is that winter, whether there be an overlap with influenza and we'd really end up with a very difficult situation. Or there'll be cyclical ones that may follow some seasonality and be part of the background for us. So I started out thinking about all of the, the, the practicalities of what happens uh, for us in our work environment. And uh, first is transport. And of course, you know, the buses have seats blocked off, which then leaves us to believe that our clinics and outpatients and everything have seats blocked off. Cycling has become a big thing, but may not be practical, of course, for many of us. But one problem we've had is carpooling. And it turns out a lot of our healthcare workers live together and a lot of our healthcare workers commute to work together. Um, and of course, that generates close contacts, another term we're all familiar with, uh, and another thing we really try to avoid. So maybe how we move in and about, and as Sam talked about contingency, we need to know that there's somebody else that can stand in for me if I'm not there. But if I share my, my lift to them, to work every day, then that's not really going to work because they're going to be out as a as a close contact. Our our environment is is very poor, um, but yet you know trolleys and corridors and emergency departments are waiting rooms where sixty or seventy people clue and clutter for for hours on end. And clearly, this has to stop, and it had to stop before this. But now we've really got the impetus. So 
Uh, certainly, I know in Beaumont Hospital, the, the seats have been ripped out. There's a new system for progressing through outpatients, but I can't simply manage the numbers that we'd like to see. Um, I found this um, position statement from the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, uh, just published earlier, uh, well, now last month. And things that we would have said would have always been the case, but now they have to say it again. Emergency departments must not become reservoirs of nosocomial infections for patients. They must not become overcrowded ever again. And hospitals must not become crowded again. Emergency care must be designed to look after the most vulnerable patients. And emergency departments must be safe places for staff to work. Um, I think we'd sorry, all... sorry to interrupt you on your slides don't seem to be advancing on my screen which makes me think they're not advancing on other people's screen as well ah. oh I'm still on the yellow coronavirus 19 with the red square okay thanks Sam um, definitely advancing from me let me see if uh, I can I think maybe you have to ask Erica would she just ask her to advance yes yeah, no problem what slide are you on I'll try it now how about that now have you got it now If you just got, tell Erica which slide you need. I'm on one that says the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. Can you yeah, see that now? Up. Yeah, we can see that. Um, OK. Yeah. OK, thanks. Um, so, yeah, I, I, and as Mike Ryan, the Irishman in WHO that we see on the evening briefings, has said that the place that this will resurge from is probably in a busy emergency department. Um, so a, a real challenge. And how do we do that? Um, and I, I guess yeah, talking through the emergency department and everybody's had parallel hospitals, you know, we built two hospitals in one as everywhere else did. Now we're trying to unpick that with sight on how we could actually resurge or, or be safe about identifying the people that are that we need to. Um, we've taken the approach in Beaumont Hospital where we test universally. So we're nearly four weeks into testing every admission that comes into hospital, be there a suspicion of COVID or not. Um, and that means that we then identify them when they arrive on the wards. And that's actually in the last six weeks, the majority of our cases have been found through that route, not through the COVID pathway. So they present either with a surgical problem or, or any other medical problem, not the classic cases that we were dealing with in uh, late March and into April, um, but that then creates uh, a few contacts in the ward and a, a, a trace back, but that's been our most functional way to do so. And then there's the ward infrastructure. And of course, the wards aren't fit for purpose. We've got six bedded bays. We've moved to under occupancy. So four in a six bedded bay is our recommendation. And most days that happens. But of course, as the hospital is getting busier, that's not happening. Uh, and of course, no visiting. And that's a big impact on how care proceeds uh, and our with patients to be able to communicate with family members or as I had with Arnie Hill, uh, a deaf lady who was having breast surgery. And of course, she couldn't lip read because everybody was wearing masks. Um, so there are other additional small challenges that come with this. Um, the HSC does have a document that says that all new builds should be single patient rooms with a en suite. Um, of course, I think it's that likely that we're suddenly going to get an infrastructural transformation of that magnitude. But that's um, a number of years existing. And some hospitals, of course, had new builds that were suddenly used uh, in this setting. Once we've got patients in, the next question people ask me is about when we can remove the isolation from them. Um, and this data is constantly changing, as indeed all of it is. But this article is just last week, um, and it's using viral culture. Because once you use a PCR test, we know the PCR can remain positive for a long time, but it doesn't show viable virus. So this group in Canada looked at over 100 samples, uh, and they show that by day eight, you couldn't culture virus from uh, infected individuals. So the virus is essentially dead and gone at that stage. So at the moment, we're still operating on a 14 day, but it, I think this will inform the evidence shift. And it means that that'll allow again more flow that once people have gone past eight days or maybe 10, someone will come in between that will say that they're no longer infectious. And that might allow planning of surgery or move onto an open ward, all of those things that will let things progress. So I think there's science is going to change this as we go along, obviously. I think some of the basic principles are going to become more to the fore. So the five moments of hand hygiene, um, and I think that in many areas, we're going to have to look back at those. Some air hospitals have looked at their hand hygiene audits and found a correlation with areas of clusters and outbreaks. And there's a lot of technology around monitoring people's um, ability to comply, whether that's, again, because of infrastructure or because of practice. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that and a lot more um, review of practice. I ended up being a poster boy in Beaumont Hospital with this early on just can people not just stay arms with away from one another um, 
but it's very hard to do when your corridor is barely two meters wide and you stop to have a chat with somebody. The 30% on this represents the, the, uh, the number of healthcare workers that are positives thus far in this country. So they're way disproportionately representative in the positives of the 25,000 in Ireland, more than in any other jurisdiction, actually. Um, often, the healthcare workers are very much affected early in an epidemic, and in Wuhan they were, and in Italy where they were. In Ireland we were, but we, we kind of maintained that level a bit above and beyond. And I think it was the silent epidemic that those numbers weren't really clear all the way going along, that some days you nearly there were more healthcare workers than community patients. And I think early on they were community acquisition and the people who have to still come to work, but it was very hard to again maintain the distancing and not pass on to healthcare workers, to colleagues. So there's other debate about one meter or two meter and people may have views on this and I know that so the pub industry does and everybody wants it to be clearer and they don't like this thing of um, the Irish solution that's um, two meters, but if you can't, one meter. And, and there is science for it. So this is a, a paper just at the 1st of June um, this is the uh, the absolute risk of transmission. Um, the different colors represent different levels of infectivity of the index cases. And then down here is one meter on the uh, X axis and two meters. So if you manage to keep one meter distance, you have a dramatic reduction in the infectivity. If you manage to do two meters, you do better. So yeah, one meter good, two meters better, and that will remain the case. And I think uh, we have an issue that we have beds that aren't even two meters from each other. So we can't socially distance the patients in a bay. We're familiar again with, with PPE and as debates will go on about which type of mask and what to wear in which scenario. Um, and as Sam alluded to, we ended up getting supplies that we wouldn't normally have used. I think we're going to see this more and I think we're going to see more nuance in it. Um, and um, we also have to think about how functional it is, particularly in surgery, to do long procedures in you know very cumbersome materials. Um, so that's a question I constantly ask my colleagues about will a test or will an intervention make difference to the PPE you wear during that procedure? And that um, at the moment depends a little bit about the confidence of the type of procedure. And I'm sure we can talk more about aerosol generating procedures or those things that might potentially transmit. Uh, a little bit of light relief is the, the facial hair and masks. So um, if you have facial hair, this is from the CDC. There's very specific types that will fit with a mask and ones that won't. Um, otherwise, it ends up with hoods. Lots of innovation um, and some of it will stay. Um, this is a social distancing app that um, we developed at Beaumont with um, actually just some, some friends of mine. Um, and we have it running um, amongst some of the services. So basically each person's an anonymous user and um, all of their interactions are tracked via Bluetooth. So we don't know who they are, we don't know where they are, but we know who they meet. Part one of this app, it, it, it alerts, it buzzes in your pocket when you're within two meters of another person to alert you to try and stay away from them. Um, and the second part is it tracks all the relationships. So this is the kind of live data we get that we have relationships who are in, in contact with who for what duration at what distance. And then should one of them turn positive, we instantly get the contacts and they can be contacted to the occupational health department. So this also kind of informs a potential return to work that we can show we have a system that can robustly and quickly uh, establish the contacts and try to limit it. Because that was again, a, another big issue. I think through this first wave was you know, you're trying to recall who you were in contact with last Tuesday. How many people were you close to? In our environment, it's very, very difficult to do. Um, and this then buckets people into levels of distance. So we, rather than just being arbitrary 15 minutes, two meters, we can actually nuance it because sometimes people were spent five hours in a room together. They were distanced, but there was no ventilation. Outpatients, again, HSE has uh, governance and there was lots of change in terms of that remote prescribing practice that came in. You can write an electronic prescription now, something we've been looking for for years. Um, telemedicine implementation and guidance around it. And really, if the physical infrastructure of clinics can't change that much, maybe we're going to have to do longer days. If you can't get 60 patients in in that four or five hour slot because they're crowded in, maybe our clinics are going to run late into the evenings. Um, Medlis is a, another national implementation program for a single laboratory system. And I think um, it's been delayed by this, but it would also help us that maybe your pre-op screening, your bloods could be done at the GP, but you'll be able to see them. Um, so limiting patients' movements. Many of us are dealing with outdated IT systems. That needs to change, it needs to change radically. If we're going to do all this remote stuff, we need to have the bandwidth. We've been using a mobile app in Beaumont Hospital, which tracks patients with COVID. So once they're in, once we feel they're anyway fit for discharge, we send them home with a pulse oximeter and an app. 
They report their symptoms, they do their SATs, their heart rate reports to us, and we watch that remotely on a panel. So we can look at 150 patients, watch them twice a day, have alerts that come in, but we don't have to interact with them in the traditional way. In terms of theatre and recovery, special environments, you know, many theatres, of course, are designed with positive pressure, which is a disaster for something like this. Um, so whether some of them couldn't actually be repurposed, we found in Beaumont, you, had to, you can turn them off, but you couldn't certainly turn them the other way around in the event that you actually had to operate on somebody who had COVID. Um, and the other graphic is showing um, the full PAPRs and respirator systems, which, um, you know, some services, certainly ENT and neurosurgeons, people with high velocity drills and aerosol generating procedures would have to use um, if they weren't clear about the person's status or indeed if they were positive. And this makes, adds time and complexity to the procedure. And then the workforce. Well, as, again, as others have talked about the contingency, we all need to have somebody else who could stand in. And I, I found this now just in this last week in terms of surgical specialties that there are, you know, some very small units in this country that there are very few people that can do a procedure. So maybe we really need to look at workforce. We need to increase our numbers anyway. But this is, again, an argument that uh, that can't be only one person that does one thing because they mightn't be around. Um, Absenteeism, you know, we've fallen back to where we were before all of this to sort of three to five percent. Um, and there was absenteeism because of fear and there was absenteeism because of genuine COVID. And that was high at times. And then uh, the issue of pre uh, presentism. So we know this from studies uh, in flu times is that healthcare workers, in particular doctors, turn up to work. They're not well, they're feeling terrible, but they turn up to work. And that was an issue for us in wave one. We needed people who were sick to not be in work. We um, did a couple of screening of asymptomatic um, healthcare workers and patients because we had clusters that were unexplained. We tested 128 staff and 28% of them were positive. Um, about 40% of them reported that, that they actually did have symptoms, but not enough that they felt they shouldn't be at work, but actually they shouldn't have been at work. Um, but the other 60% of them most of them, and 70% of them went on to, de to develop symptoms in the following 72 hours. Some of them never developed symptoms. But this, again, this has been shown in other jurisdictions, but um, people tend to present to work and asymptomatic cases are a feature of this disease. Vaccination, flu, influenza, we've been pushing for 70% vaccination rates of healthcare workers. Nobody, nowhere except Temple Street has achieved it in Ireland. Uh, I think looking at this winter, we're going to have to try and do better. And, you know, eventually there'll be a COVID or a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine? Are we going to mandate that? How are we going to work through that? And then prophylaxis. So there are studies ongoing with prophylactic agents, particularly in healthcare workers. I have to say one of those agents, hydroxychloroquine, has largely fallen out of favour over concerns over its safety. And I think we don't have something in that space at the moment, but we will again. Antibody responses. So as a, as a healthcare worker, if I've had COVID, am I going to be protected? Well, again, this is an evolving field. We can't say for sure. What we do know is this is 285 patients, 100% of them had a detectable antibody response, IgG, at 19 days. Whether that's protective or not, we don't know. It's just too early. We know with other coronaviruses, it offers some protection, but that might be months or potentially a year or so at most, but not really that durable. And uh, healthcare workers. So a study we were doing ourselves, but this is a preprint from Birmingham where they did five, looked at 500 healthcare workers in a large trust. Um, and after that first wave had been, they did a sero study and uh, you can see there nearly 32 percent of them were sero positive the majority of those were in the acute medical areas the COVID areas the surgical and anesthetic areas were much lower but worryingly asymptomatic was about 15 percent that had uh, apparently acquired the infection asymptomatically so it's another thing we're interested in beaumont is staff testing you know that the test is pretty invasive at the moment and anybody who's had it done it's uh, you know tickling your pituitary it's quite a deep invasive procedure could we do that in a serial way um we're actually piloting it in the renal transplant in an area of highest risk to get that going again we think the only belt and braces approach is that that team is isolated they're separated out and they're tested quite intensively antibody testing where again we're rolling that out the national validation is going on at beaumont and I don't think that will provide that we can by any means say you're immune and send you in to work in a in a COVID area or in a suspect area. But what it might mean is you have some level of immunity and it means that you're very unlikely to get it and unlikely to pass it on. So maybe you should work with the most vulnerable patients. So maybe it means that you can be clerking in transplant patients or frail elderly patients or dialysis patients. But um, by no means does it mean that you can operate without PPE, certainly not at this point in time. 
Now, the immunity passport has been raised, it's been discussed in WHO back as far as April, the idea that somebody who has evidence of antibodies could actually move, uh, and I mean move between institutions or organisations, move between countries. Um, but at the moment, we just don't have the science to say that's true. We're piloting a dashboard in Beaumont, which might inform the return to surgical normality and all normality. So uh, a kind of a traffic light system that says, how are things going and what should we do? So we have a roadmap for the country about lockdown, but we don't quite yet have a clear roadmap about hospital. So look at, you know, the number of new, R1 looks at the number of new cases in 48 hours, the number of cases in our community locally, the number of hospital acquired cases, clusters, our ITU capacity, the overall hospital occupancy and healthcare worker cases to try to inform a decision about, uh, is this a manageable level? Can we proceed on to the next or not? Um, and then the specifics of surgery. So this just last week in The Lancet is uh, an international cohort study on surgical outcomes through COVID. What I would say with this is this is just surgery that happened during COVID. Um, and most of these centres, they were dealing with surge at the time or they weren't quite fully aware. So there wasn't a strategy there. But the overall 30 day mortality was 23, 24 percent and pulmonary complications were frequent up to 50 percent with, with very high mortality rates. Irrespective of whether that was uh, people under the age of 70 or over the age of 70, elective, minor or major, I think the mortality rates were far exceeded what would be expected in absence of COVID. So uh, internationally, there are guidance on this. I know the Royal Colleges have uh, a decision documented on this as well. Locally at Beaumont, this is our plan. This is our document. It stretches out that we have pre-assessment, uh, 14 days of advice cocooning. Um, a week prior to surgery, you get a call to see is everything going OK? And then 48 hours before admission to hospital, you get tested for COVID with the PCR test. Those results have to be acted on and communicated. And then you have your admission, which is a planned separate route. And again, it's discussed this is wards that are kept for surgical admissions only and then discharged to be expedited as timely as possible and follow up to be done remotely. Obviously, there's issues with this, you know, 14 days of cocooning for some minor surgery uh, is you know, not feasible for many people and maybe not necessary. Again, this is all going to change as the community, as the traffic light system, I think, changes over time, but at least offers a roadmap of what to do. Um, we've published on our experience with it because at Beaumont, we, although much of surgery was, was largely shut down, there was small amounts of it kept going. Um, so we had this system where we tested people. We had a dedicated area for them to come in. Uh, this is the urology data we published. So 101 procedures were carried on. With that, there was three symptomatic diagnosed in the perioperative period. Three of them developed severe illness and one died. Um, but still leaves an, an awful lot of mortality that's far lower than that published in the, the Lancet cohort series. So our testing pod has continued on with uh, nearly 460 tests done in those 48 hours before. That's a drive through testing pod. The range of surgical specialties is broadly representative. Um, we've had three that were COVID-19 detected. And that's that's a worry because these are people who are largely, this is oncological or you know, critical urgent elective surgery, that um, these are cocooned patients, but still we found cases. And of course, then those cases are deferred. There's a discussion about them. And with what we know about it, there's a small delay uh, and better outcomes. So we have it added to basically the pre-op checklist. This is our drive-through pod attached to the back of the hospital, which is staffed by physician associates. Um, and summing up then, uh, I'm sure there's so much more to talk about and it's impossible to talk about it all, but clearly there's an opportunity for infrastructure change and how timely that might be. Um, there's electronic stuff that really needs to catch up with what we now want to do and what we have been doing. Uh, unless we have patient flow, we're going to end up with bottlenecks and clusters of patients, particularly in emergency departments. Um, I think infection prevention control is going to remain preeminent in what we do. It's now got a more pivotal role in testing. Uh, you know, as the director of WHO said many months ago now, test, test, test. I think we have vast amounts of testing capacity at the moment. We need to use it wisely. We need to use it widely. Uh, and staffing, you know, the, the, the learning from this, the derogations that occurred with contacts that led to further cases, having contingencies and uh, pathways. And then what I haven't touched on this, of course, is um, medical education. And I, I'm staff at RCSI as well, and the college has done amazingly through the first part of this, but how do we do it in the next bit when we want to have people actually on the wards and seeing patients? So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Owen, thanks a million for that. Uh really comprehensive, lots and lots of issues that we all have to try and uh, get our heads around, I guess. 
uh, and go from there. So we've had a very active uh, chat uh, during all those uh, talks, guys, and uh, lots of various questions coming in. Even before the uh, seminar, we would always ask people to send in their questions in advance. So we've quite a number of questions there. Uh, some are obviously uh, in a similar theme, and I'll try and group them as best we can together. So I suppose maybe just to throw it out kind of one of the, the big kind of broader questions and, and any of the panel are all can get involved in this. But you know, one thing that's going to be out there is like, how long are we likely to see the, the kind of current restrictions uh, remain in place? Um, and probably, you know, and what are the factors that will actually start changing the approaches? So the, how long will the two meter thing be there? How long are we going to have to uh, be very, very cautious, you know, around uh, gatherings and around running clinics, maybe the way that things used to be and so on? Or are we actually just gone past all those sort of discussions and we just need to adapt and move on? Sam, maybe you'd comment uh, on think, that. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, my view is that it depends on our national strategy. And many of us in Infectious Aid would very strongly advocate following in New Zealand and Jacinda Ardern, who's followed an elimination strategy by hitting it really hard and early. That unfortunately requires the good people in Northern Ireland to join us on this because we're on one island. And it would be even better if all the great people in Britain would join us as well into two islands in the way that Australia and New Zealand and several other East uh, Asian countries like South Korea, uh, Japan, uh, Taiwan and China are doing. So I'm hoping we'll get there. The Northern Ireland guys are doing much better now than they were in February. And even Boris Johnson is now starting to do uh, test, 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 contact tracing in the community. So they're actually doing a U-turn without announcing it as a U-turn. And I think they're realising that if they don't do that, then we're going to be stuck with this bloody two metres and no dancing and no festivals for the rest of the next five to seven years, which is and, and all the restrictions on economic productivity. So I, I hope that we get there. Yeah, I think it's going to be a constant balance, isn't it? Like we we can't function like this and there will be the off target effects of COVID. Um, at the moment, people are still wary and you may be aware there have been clusters you know, in the west of Ireland now. Um, and I, you know, I think as long as we've got robust systems and testing capacity and the eyes on it, and I think it now it's just sort of what we're trying to develop is a surveillance system for the hospital, like there's a surveillance system for the, you know, the, the general pub public, then we'll be able to respond to it. But I think, you know, uh, as uh, as our CEO in, in the hospital always says, it's very easy to turn off things and the turn off is, is surgery, unfortunately, usually. But we have to be willing to get it going again because we know we can turn it off as long as we can keep an eye on what's happening and really understand the epidemiology. Um, Related yeah. to that, I mean, that's where possibly where, where are we at with the, 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 the vaccines uh, and the, the, the studies going into vaccines and indeed maybe treatments? Uh, for some of the, the conditions that are emerging. So both of us have done a lot of work on phase one, phase two and phase three studies on vaccine, including collaborating for many years with the Oxford group uh, who are developing the vaccines. And the best reality I can bring to that is that the, the product time is seven years for human vaccines historically. Yeah. Yeah. So unless we're dramatically better this time than before, uh, we expect seven years. It might never happen. Perhaps some things are impossible to develop vaccines too well. And even for when you cut the corners, a product cycle for a veterinary product is three years. So this idea of a vaccine in six months or nine months is a best of best case scenario. I'm not saying it's impossible, but everything has to just work perfectly the first time. I think the Small molecules obviously may well work as well. Remdesivir, it's not the answer, but it's a partial answer. A bit like AZT, the first drug for AIDS. Uh, after about 10 or 12 years, then we triple therapy, and now it's more or less solved, as we said earlier. So I, I, I think that will come as an answer, but maybe in five, seven years' time. Kieran, can I come in yeah. for a second? Yes. Is, is there a scenario where just we are going to have to accept that there is a constant ripple in the background uh, and, and that we just have to get on with it. Because uh, if we can avoid a second tsunami, uh, there are going to be, unless, unless we do this, there are going to be more people dying from avoidable causes that we're not treating uh, because we're simply closing things down. Um, your view on this, I mean, is, is it going to be possible to get back to a new normal, but to a normal that really in practical terms, somebody coming in for a hernia, you can't have everybody two weeks uh, cocooning mm. and being tested. Yeah. We're going to yeah. have to accept that there is a prevalence of this uh, disease 
and that yes, there will be unfortunate outcomes occasionally. Yeah, I think that's certainly a possibility. The question is, what, where do you set that threshold? And at present, I'm very happy to say, even though you see between 10 and 70 cases a day, more than 90% of those are now known contacts of previously existing outbreak cases. And only about 10%, between two and 10 of those absolute numbers, are really new community transmission. So I can say that the community transmission Ireland is around maybe one in a million per day. And perhaps that rate, as you say, Ronan, is acceptable. If it was to stay at one in a million for, for the foreseeable future, that, that would perhaps be OK for most of us, because maybe there's a 1% mortality for younger people, maybe a 14% mortality for people over 80. But it's similar then to the risk of a road accident or risks that we take in every day by choice in our life. Whereas if it was to go up maybe tenfold above that and the rate of transmission was 50 per million per day, then we clearly need to socially distance again and go back to living in our own houses as we are now and, and, and try and bring that down. So I, I completely agree with you. And if we don't reach elimination, then that's the option. Mm. I, I mean, I, I agree, Sam, but I think there's another element to this, which is uh, particularly for the surgical specialties is because they're going to intervene and do something. And um, the worry then is, you know, well, you could have timed it differently. And it, it's an impossible decision often, you know, that if you know that somebody was positive, even if it's a ridiculously small risk, um, the, the fear is, is also about somebody acquires it in hospital and people have been through this with VRE and CP and MRSA, that there's a, there's a stigma associated with it and a, a, you know, a worry beyond what the, the figures are. <clears throat> yeah, one of the kind of prevailing questions that people are coming up with is, I guess, trying to understand the, the risks to clinical staff. Uh, in the midst of treating like this. So yes, PPE and all the different precautions that people can take, they're in different settings and outpatients or in a, in a theatre, but you mentioned PAPR and so on. Uh, how do we reassure staff that, you know, what they, what would they be, should be expecting in order to be reassured that they can safely go to work and, uh, uh, and, and care for patients without putting their own uh, health at risk? Yeah, in my view, it's the knowledge of the population prevalence of this virus in the population that you're meeting through work, whether patients or fellow staff. And I can tell you that if you were in Sligo today, there's been no cases for 14 days. So going out and having a bit of a party and doing intimate surgery in Sligo is, is probably fine. But unfortunately, that's not the case in, in Dublin or, or in Clare or in Cork. So and, and unfortunately, it's changing all the time. So uh, if some if a load of us go up to Ross's Point for the weekend and bring it, one of us brings it up there, it could start again in Sligo. So it's a dynamic changing thing, which is where the national surveillance, I think, at local granular level is essential. So I think letting people know that, I think that's where NEFID will go and the public health doctors will have to start telling people out clearly that uh, Sligo and Donegal are basically fine and starting to celebrate that. They're not quite at that point yet because then they're worried that everyone will suddenly start uh, going wild in Sligo and Donegal and officially the end of an outbreak is when you've doubled the uh, free of disease that's 14 multiplied by 2 which is 28 days and we haven't got quite to that 28 day threshold yet in either Sligo or Donegal but what do you think on? Yeah I, I think I think it's been very hard for people because the science changed as this went along like not only it was an epidemic but and a pandemic but of a new pathogen so we started out you know in the first case I assessed on the 24th of January uh, you know, and I came into the hospital and we put them in a negative pressure room and I went in and full PP and did the whole thing and I do it all on the telephone, don't go near them, to the point where now yesterday I was on COVID call and I walk in and out of rooms with, a, you know, an apron with no sleeves on it. Um, you know, it's a, it's a huge difference, but that's for, for healthcare workers, that's been very hard for them to see. You say, oh my God, you told me all this, um, but now you're doing this. But that's the science of it. And I think we've got to communicate that to people. Uh, you know, what we do know now is you know, in, in any of the hot COVID areas where we had lots of patients, when people use the basic PPE, they didn't get COVID. You know, what, what happened, the healthcare workers, unfortunately, that got it were in areas that they assumed or thought were clean. Um, and as um, Jerry Sheehan, one of the ID consultants in the matter, said it on a, on a meeting I was at, that, uh, you know, good geriatric care is the antithesis of good, you know, COVID care, because people are getting close, close and touching patients. And um, that's what we can't do at the moment, or at least be cognizant of the simple steps. But yeah. yeah, it's a fair point. Um, and I mean, the, the current test is, uh, you know, it's an awful test, the swab. It's, you know, it's they're very uncomfortable. And if we want to get to a stage where we're doing lots and lots of testing of people, um, is there a different 
are there different tests or approaches to the tests emerging uh, that might make things a little bit easier for us to deal with that? Yeah, so as I put up on, on my side, we have a study um, which just about to start with exhaled breath exudate, so a condensate. So you basically breathe into a tube uh, and we've used it together with the RCSI Molecular Medicine Group um, on the, the clinically positive cases that weren't PCR positive by the nasopharyngeal swab and we picked up more of them. So we think it's more accurate and it's a lot easier to blow into a tube. And you could think that maybe you're on a transplant team, you're asked once a week to essentially be breathalyzed. That's a lot more palatable. Cork are doing a study on a salivary test, a buccal salivary test, um, and there are other diagnostics coming. There's also a debate that actually it doesn't need to be a pituitary biopsy to, to get the sample, but um, the UK are doing self-test kits for healthcare workers. So they did it early on, but they're doing it again now that you just self-test and they're looking at the how that compares. And then just on that, Owen, I'm I'm cognizant of the recent uh, view that we had to have absolute certainty about uh, the results. Uh, I mean, given that the uh, the sensitivity of these tests is at best eighty percent, uh, as I understand it, um, how uh, you know it's going to be very difficult to reassure the public that uh, even doing a once a week, um, you know, test. Uh, that's got an 80% sensitivity is is sufficient. Uh, it's it's a bit tricky. Yeah, it is. And I guess there's two bits. There's, there's two elements to it. There's, there's the test and the sensitivity of the test and there's the implications of the result. So we, we do know that the people who we can't find it on PCR wise, they actually haven't got virus that's out there. So in terms of an infection risk, they also seem to be a lot less likely to transmit. So um, there's two elements to it. But again, that's explaining the science to people, and I think we're probably not in the setting of this pandemic. I don't think we've been very good at that. And I mean, the other thing I guess is on everyone's worry is, you know, coming in now to the autumn, are we going to see a second surge? What's that going to profile going to look like? We're going to have to have it in the midst of the the usual flu uh, season that's going to hit. The other colds that are going to be around. We're going to try and send kids back to school, so you know that these things are going to start emerging. Symptoms all start to look alike. Um, what sort of uh, picture, Sam, are you seeing that we need to try and be uh, ready for in, in come the autumn? So um, this is what a lot of the journalists are asking me in the last few days. because it's, it's really a good question. I hope it's a second ripple rather than a second wave or even a second tsunami. If if we if we if the second wave is worse than the first, we've learned nothing good from the first. So we have to put in place surveillance and stockpiles of PPE and adequate kits for diagnosis and contact tracing mechanisms that could be ramped up really quickly. We have to prepare our population. I hope we get to phase five in July and we're back having fun again, sailing again. But unfortunately, we have to be ready for going back to phase one or even worse, going back to phase zero as a national population in November or December. So we could be back where we are. And leading that, it's probably going to fall, obviously, to Michael Martin to lead us in that route. It's important that he can somehow lead 99% of us in that route with some social cohesion so we don't start biffing each other and rioting and mass gatherings and protest, as we've been seeing in several other countries. That That's the antithesis of social distancing. Uh, and social disharmony will almost inevitably be accompanied, uh, you know, by a spread of the coronavirus out of control. Uh, and I think, you know, for any subsequent waves, we need to do things a little bit differently in terms of the off target things. So early on, I was canvassing with my colleagues at work uh, about a Wuhan or a Lombardy model where you used groups and you did specify a surgical hospital. Uh, you know, that was patients are heavily tested, but you need to keep those things going. And particularly if we have subsequent waves, I think we really need to look at the centers where you can do those things and continue business as usual separately. Yeah, that's, I mean, and, and Sam, you mentioned earlier, like, like New Zealand, Taiwan, South Korea, and I think the, the whole kind of social contract thing, that's the app that sort of binds the whole thing together, isn't it? Um, and I guess when we have to start looking at uh, how do we, you look at South Korea and you look at Taiwan, and they're able to, cab people are still able to kind of go about their day to day lives, but with wearing masks, social distancing, good hygiene, and it's just trying to keep that momentum up, isn't it? Yeah, the the I mean a comment I'll add to this is that my sort of public health um, value for money hat on uh, reminds me that um, 
hip replacement is one of the best, most cost effective operations out there. I'm sure there are some orthopedic surgeons like, and we need to get the people who need hip replacements, need hip replacements. And that really, really helps them. So to me, it's really important that that we get those really important basic surgeries. I, I don't mean basic as in simple because it's quite a big operation, but we need to get that up and going uh, for, for people's health. Look, we're, we're just coming on just past seven now, and uh, I think we had the very stimulating presentations and uh, conversations and discussions there. Um, I think we've managed to address most of the questions that people have been putting to us. Um, as always, we kind of leave the last word to the president, uh, who may want to sum up a few things or leave us with a, a parting thought on things. Um, and uh, so, uh, Ronan, mm -hmm. if you wanted to just say anything there. Well, can I thank uh, Sam and Owen uh, very much indeed for thoughtful and uh, very, uh, uh, very much to the point presentations. Um, and I think uh, the conversation that has emerged has, has been uh, useful. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, I'm I'm over optimistic that we will get through the summer uh, um, uh, without without some uh, bumps in the road, and I am anxious about what things will look like in the autumn. Uh, we can't have uh, a situation where we're back with trolleys and corridors, and it's how we're going to avoid that. And throughout my surgical career, and uh, I've just retired after 40 years uh, of surgical training and, and consultant, at every juncture when the squeeze came on, it was elective surgery that felt the brunt. Mm. And uh, there have been a thousand gallbladders that haven't been done in the last three months, a thousand hip replacement that haven't been done in the last three months. And I are just added to the waiting list of the other thousands that haven't been done. And we can't allow that. We're going to have to uh, find a solution. We're going to have to find pathways that we can give overall guidance to, but each individual hospital is going to have to find its own solution. Each uh, of the healthcare units, uh, Ireland East or CSI Hospital Group Safe, they're going to have to find a pathway. And that may be designating one as the emergency and one as the elective hospital. And then, as you say, being very careful about the hygiene um, and social distancing that we we have within those. So no doubt we'll revisit this uh, many times in coming months. Can I uh, congratulate both Owen and Sam and thank them on our behalf for the work they've been doing and thank Kieran and his staff and Erica in the background uh, for running what's been a very interesting webinar. I wish you well and uh, perhaps we'll see you same time, same place next week. That's the plan. That's the plan. Thanks, guys, for a great discussion. I really appreciate your time on this. Um, and uh, we'll be coming back. We're, we're lucky in RCSI to have uh, such great colleagues uh, who can give us informed on the whole area here. So uh, we'll keep everybody informed. Uh, we're bringing up to date new information all the time on the website. Um, and we'll be having more and more of these webinars uh, dealing with more specific areas uh, on how to try and get the, the surgical activity back up and running again. So again, thanks for everybody. Best, uh, best of luck to everyone in the next week or so. And uh, good night. Thanks. Karen Ronan, thanks very much.